welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, I'm Tasneem Abrahams, and this is the Private Practice Growth Club YouTube channel, where we talk all about tips, tools, tutorials, and resources for health practitioners in South Africa wanting to start or grow a private practice. Today's guest is another, fe another featured practice owner. It's Karen Swanepoel from Karen Swanepoel Industrial Psychologists based out in Pretoria. And I'm really excited to welcome her as a guest today to talk all about um, the different work that she does. And I'm sure she's going to share some valuable tips on how you can get into this industry. So welcome, Karen, and thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Tasneem. It is very nice to, to chat with you today. So, Karen, I'd like you to maybe um, introduce yourself and tell um, the listeners who you are and what it is that you do. Okay, I'm an industrial psychologist. Um, before that, I worked in the police services for many, many years. Um, I'm not going to give the year now, but you will work out my age. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I had gained a lot of exposure. Um, I headed the suicide prevention project and I worked at psychological services. And then I've decided to venture into the, into the private sector. So I worked, um, oh, yeah, and then I got my master's while I was in the police service. Um, and then I worked with lots of industrial psychologists within the medical legal industry. And it's an industry that I kind of realized that I've got a passion for it. It's a very complex field, and I gained a lot of experience working with experienced industrial psychologists. And there I started my journey. So the reason I invited you um, onto my show is especially because you are in the medical legal space. And um, what caught my eye was that you were offering um, workshops um, on how to, you know, how to be a, a provider in this space. Um, and the reason I reached out to you is because, you know, across other professions like occupational therapy or physiotherapy, um, they, they are opportunities to start practices in that space particularly, but it's not the same as your typical clinical practice. Um, and so it's, it's, there's a lot of curiosity or a lot of um, unknowns in that industry in how you get in that industry, what skills you need, how do you operate it, you know, that kind of thing. And given that you have been in the space for such a long time and you're really passionate about it, I thought you would be an, an amazing guest to come on to talk about that and also then share a little bit about these workshops you do. So tell me a little bit about the medical legal space. Like what is it exactly about and what is the role of the health practitioner when they are operating in that space? It's basically a combination of law medical experts and your expertise as an industrial focusing on loss of earnings so it is a combination of the law medical and psychology um, it is a very complex field and like you said you just just don't start your practice and you and you go on running with it it takes years of experience and that is what I was privileged to gain after I left the police service. Um, you were quite right when you said that it's not a very, in, very friendly industry or a very open industry to get into. And we have realized that um, because of the request for our core, I want to come and work with you, I will work for free just to gain knowledge. Um, there's not a lot of um, training and um, information about this industry in, in a, um, um, outside. So we decided to start our basic workshops um, for the people and in my, you know, to make it affordable for students, interns, etc., just to gain an understanding of the broader concept of what is medico psycho -legal. Is it the industry that I can work in? Would I enjoy working in it? Because you either love it or you hate it. Um, so then we um, progress to our intermediate workshop that it's 
it, it's not, it is more in depth. So it discusses issues with regards to the industrial psychologist role, with, it, with earning scales, postulations, um, how does the report look like, um, what you must do and, must, and what you mustn't do. And we've been now requested to do advanced workshop um, and we are doing it with an actually. So um, it's something that we want to share because it's a very close knit industry. You can't get into this industry very easily, especially if you don't have the experience or you know the knowledge. Um, sometimes I think this whole industry is very romanticized and you think, oh, it's a very, you know, I can do this, but you don't know really what goes into it as it is very complex. It's based on years of experience, um, especially after we saw a lot of reports, we thought, um, let us just try and, and empower people to uplift the standard in any case. Because when you write your report, each person's report differ. Um, you can't just copy and paste. Um, you have to build a holistic picture of that person from the time that he or she was born until the time. And when you write your report, you must, you, you need to have that confidence to present your case in court. Um, so you must believe in what you are writing. Um, that is the nice part of it. So mm -hmm. a typical person in this field, I say it's a lot of introverts um, that likes to <laughs> sit behind their computers and type. Um, but my colleague is an extrovert and she and she loves it um, you know, she loves it um, um, as well. So it's a, it's not a specific personality. Um, maybe a person that can think out of the box, can use figures. Um, I was not very good with maths at school, um, <laughs> so I learned. Um, and to build arguments. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a problem across any situation when you are trying to find employment where there's that catch-22 where certain highly specialized fields require a lot of experience, but you need to get the experience somehow. <laughs> so, um, you know, and we're going to get to, we're going to get back to that, but I want to just go back a little bit to when you first started out in this industry. Um, you know, you mentioned at the beginning that you realized that this was the area you really liked and this was the area you wanted to be in. What was it about this, industry that attracted you to it, that made you like it so much and gave you this passion for it? What I love about this is when you see broken people, they step into your office and they step out with a smile. And that's, that gives me goosebumps. When you know that you can really assist this person and make a difference in their lives, so what I love about it is people that I see sending me messages and say, thank you, doc. Or they call me doc. I've tried to explain that I'm not a doctor, but I think it's a, just a means of, you know, respect. Um, research. I love research. So you have to think about what is happening currently in South Africa and in the world. So it's, um, challenges your way of thinking and it keeps you on your toes. I love it when people or my clients tell me, Corin, thank you for walking that extra mile. I love empowering people. I love making changes in their lives or bringing meaning to their lives. I love seeing minors because I always take cookies with me and when they get into the into the practice where you know where I see the clients, especially in the Eastern Cape, they love to take pictures with me. And then I will open my drawer. I think I think the word travels that this that this lady, this girl, they call me that, you know, that girl has cookies in her drawer. So and just to 
just to add something else and different to their lives is is amazing. Hmm. I'm glad you say that, and I must admit, I'm a bit surprised by your answer because I think for a lot of um, therapists who are in a more clinical space, um, why they would never consider going into me medical legal is because they think, you know, like you're not really making a difference because it's you're just assessing and writing reports. That's kind of the outsider's point of view. So it's very interesting to hear you say that a large part of what you like about it is actually making a difference in people's lives. Yes. So talk to me a little bit about that. For those people who have no clue what medical legal actually is and what it entails, can you maybe give a run through of a typical day in the life of kind of scenario where you have just been allocated a new client, for example? What what does what does your work actually entail, and what difference is it that you make in people's lives? Okay, so your client, it's usually the attorney that books his client to come and see you. So usually they see other experts before me. So first of all, getting traumatized over and over again, telling their stories. It's not. Mm very nice um, to go over it time and time again. And then I've got an interview. I have an interview with a person um, in depth, um, especially focusing on more career. Or, um, say, say, for instance, you were a general surgeon and you were involved in an accident and you lost your right hand. Okay, so what was the impact of that? Um, before that happened, the person was a general surgeon, he could have gotten promoted or progress in his career, and he could have worked, for example, until the age of 70. Now that he has lost his hand, he can't operate. So what is the impact of that? Is now without an income, will he be able to practice? Will he be able to consult? Um, so there was a huge impact on his life. Um, so that is that is the sad part of that, but so that is why you go out of your way to really help this person. Um, um, another thing that happens quite often is, especially in the Eastern Cape, um, students that there's a huge lack of career guidance. So you're not only doing an interview to get the information that you need for your report. In between, you are doing career guidance and you are Googling and saying, yeah, but how do you think about this and this and that? Are you really interested in it? Said, yeah, but I don't know what I want to do because uh, I'm not, I don't like science and my parents want me to take science. Oh, yeah, but there's other industries, there's other things that we can look at. So you do career guidance. Um, you do counseling. Oh, I had a very sad sad case um a lady was involved in an accident and it was three years after the accident that i saw her she lost this uh, a child she child was three years old and it was the first time that she talked about it oh. describing in depth how she held the child and she said to him i have to i have to let go now she, it was, oh, I get goosebumps. Um, working with, with, with those kind of, of you know, those, those kind of um, cases. So you're not only a person doing an interview and getting facts. You're also a counsellor. You are uh, uh, giving guidance. And, yeah, that is, that is really, really nice. Mm. So what is the, the, the process when you so you see somebody for the first time? What is the um when you get the brief from the attorney? Do you do they normally give you a brief of you must assess this person to determine yes. X or what what is the brief what is typically the brief that you get when you are, are referred some? Okay, we call it a letter of letter of instruction. The okay. attorney will ask you to evaluate and assess his client for loss of earnings. So that can be the person was involved in an accident, the person, um, it was a negligence matter, um, 
we had a case of a child that was playing on the playground and a pole came loose and uh, and fell on the child. Um, shooting incidents, the police shot at someone and it was determined that he was not at fault. Um, loss of support is when um, a wife will claim um, loss of income because of the passing of her husband. So that is your letter of instruction. So you see your client and based on what the, uh, the attorney instructed you to do, you write your report. Mm -hmm. So after you've written your report, you consider all the other expert reports, you consider your research, and you base everything um, on facts and what you think would have been this person's career and earnings capacity. And now that the accident or the incident happened, um, what is the uh, career and earnings capacity now? How was it impacted um, upon? Mm. And then your report goes to the actuary that do the calculations. Um, if they are happy, it's because there's always two sides. Um, you are in service of the attorney or you are in service of the RAF. So the RAF appoint their specialist, the attorney appoint his specialist, and we must come to an, an agreement. If there's not an agreement, then you go to court to present your case. Hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm very keen to talk about the whole court situation because I think people are always scared of the court thing. But before we get to that, I, I, I'm, I'm very curious to know, um, you know, because there's this very tangible, um, you know, unlike when you have therapy, you provide therapy, you work on the client's goals, and then you maybe work towards improvement, but it's very much like um, intangible. So it's, and it's guided by what the client's improvements need to be, right? In your situation, it's almost like whatever you put in your report, um, there's, there's this almost a sense, there's a, a kind of a little of, of a, of a power that you hold over the over the future of this person, right? Or the outcome of their case. Tell me about the first time you had to write a report and you had to make recommendations. Like, did you have any like imposter syndrome over, you know, is this the right thing I'm putting down? Um, you know, what if what I'm saying is like called into question or um, you know, it makes you know it affects this person in a negative way. Did any of those things come about? Like, and how? And if so, how did you overcome it? I was very nervous. I was extremely <laughs> nervous. <laughs> so, luckily, I was supervised, and that is okay. the most important thing of this industry. You have to be supervised because mm -hmm. you're working with the legal process. You're working with with money and what you say go. Mm. So it's got a huge impact on that person's life. Oh, I was really stressed. I was just glad I, I had a supervisor that they could read through it and guide me. So that is mm. why I say experience is so, so important um, mm. because you are working with that person's life. You are working with his or her future. Yeah, so yeah. that is your, and there's so many factors that you have to think about. The level of education, the sector in which they operate. Is it in the private sector, public sector, informal sector, the type of work that they do, their history, their age, their family background, where they live, um, their employment history. You have to call the employer at confirm is this person working there um, how is this person working so it's there's a lot of of factors that you have to keep in mind when you write your mm. report so we've kind of come full circle back to that question about experience right so if you are interested to go into this industry you want to go into the medical legal industry but you have no experience in that space what would be the best way for someone to gain experience in that space? First of all, to work under supervision of an experienced industrial psychologist. 
to attend as much workshops, training out there that you can attend. But the best way is to jump in the water and you swim, but luckily under the supervision of someone that will grab your hand and not and not let you drown. And and if you if you then you know find yourself in a position to gain some experience, what would be the best way to find somebody to supervise you? Are those industrial psychologists like yourselves who have more experience generally open to supervising? Um, you know, is there a cost involved? I know as an occupational therapist in the space that I work in, there's not a lot of OTs that work with teens and adults with ADHD and executive functioning. So I get a lot of younger OTs that are interested in this space who reach out to me and they ask for mentorship, which is a paid mentorship because it's my time, right? Um, so, I mean, I freely give advice if somebody wants to just get on a call and ask me something, but if they want a structured, like where we're going to go over clinical cases, I'm setting aside yeah. an hour each month, all of those things. And the same way, um, I found someone I've been looking for a long time, somebody who does exactly what I do. I finally found somebody who has years of experience ahead of me, who I then contacted and I said off the bat. I'm happy to pay. Let me know what your rates are. Would you be willing to supervise me? How does it work in your industry? Are people open to do it? That's a difficult question because um, there's not a lot of, of openness in our industry. That's why we started the workshops. There okay. are industrial psychologists that do present internship programs because this subject is not presented at tertiary level. Mm, so mm. there is organizations, there is industrial psychologists that do um, give internships and they address medical legal. Um, there is industrial psychologists that advertise and say, listen, we are looking for people to come and work for us. And that is the way to go, to get into um, uh, a practice um, where you can, you know, where you can learn. What we also have done now is um, we've realized after our workshops, people still have a lot of questions. Okay, Karen, mm -hmm. I've got this scenario because we do a lot of practical scenarios. Um, uh, what, can you please help me? So we have um, started with Psycholegal Connect. That is where you can have a, a, a private personalized session with a qualified mentor that can assist you and guide you with regards to your to your specific need. So that has been going well. We get a lot of requests and we do um, spend that time to try and and guide you with whatever question or problem you have with, with regards to the medical legal. That's amazing because I think what that also does is it like makes the expectations really clear. So with your Psycho Legal Connect, is that a paid service? Do people pay to access time with a, an experienced supervisor? Yes. Yes. Okay. So and, and, time, and I think time spent. Yes, yeah. yeah, so so that's what I love about it is that it makes the expectations clear. So, mm. you know, a lot of people when I reach out to somebody for advice or to ask them something i always ask if there's a charge up front to remove that uncomfortableness from their part to let yes. them know that i'm okay i i expect that there might be a charge if you say to me no it's fine i'm not going to charge you then great but at least you know up front that i'm open to that if that's what the case is you can always tell me all right and if it's too high for me then i can say no it's fine I won't be able to afford that right now. And, you know, if I want it enough, I'll try to get there. But having this connect platform that you created, when people are looking for assistance and they're coming to a platform like that, it makes the expectation clear. You're coming to, to access a paid service. And the person on the other end can offer their expertise without that hanging over their shoulder that they need to charge for it and all of that stuff. So that's amazing. And how do people access that um that platform they register on our website um, underneath the, the training bar is um, psycho legal connect then you click on it then you register um, and that mail will go through to the mentors 
and I will be in contact with that person and discussing okay what you know, what type of assistance do you need um mm. the one ip um wrote her first report and um Shirion Heinz is um is the one mentor and he went uh, and he went through the through, through the report with you know with her they can also send um information beforehand so that the mentor can know okay when we start this uh, you know when we start the session um she already knows what it is about and can give the guidance mm. that the person needs mm. amazing amazing and i'll definitely put the link to your website in the description box below so people can easily access that and i'm glad you mentioned the example of somebody with a report who wrote the first report because yeah. you know like i said i asked you about your first report I think it's you know if you if you've had some clinical experience you you might feel pretty confident in doing the assessment part but even people in clinical settings they are you know there's a lot of people who struggle with the report writing part and you get courses on report writing but report writing for clinical is different to report writing for medical legal yeah. so of course when you write your first one it's probably you're probably very nervous and like yes. you always want to know is there like a template or an example because yeah. You, yeah. you don't know what you you kind of like shooting in the dark so i'm glad you use that example because you know that means that there's this option for somebody to go through it with you where yeah. you, they can actually help you to guide you on what should be there and shouldn't be in there i do want to know though so is this portal specifically for industrial psychologists or would other professions also be able to benefit from it um other professions within the medical legal sphere will mm. will also benefit from it um i get um, i've got a, a very good friend who's got a who said educational psychologist and she asked me to read through her report to make sure that we will be able to use it mm. so that was a nice experience to build that relationship and say you know what we need more of x i z and there's something that i want to touch on though that what you are doing in terms of offering your knowledge and creating this platform is quite unique and i'm linking it back to what you said before in that this industry is very closed people are kind of a bit secretive about how things work and how to get in here why do you think that is why why do you think it's the industry so closed and it's so difficult to get to know get your foot in the door if you you know if you don't by chance because a lot of the people i speak to who are in this industry whether they OTs or physios or psychologists a lot of them when you ask them about how they ended up a lot of them it's by accident like you know they happened to get their first job was in that or you know like somebody they knew or you know it was whereas a lot of the people that i know ask advice about getting in this industry they are ones who are wanting to get in there so they didn't get in there by chance they have no experiences and they are the ones who are struggling so it, i'm very curious to know what is it about what is where does the secrecy come from why is it such a closed industry i was thinking about that for a long time i i don't know i <laughs> i can't i honestly i think everyone is living in their own their own living in an oh uh, their own silos protecting mm. what they have and they don't want to share mm. uh, i think there's a lot of work outside i i like to work together to empower people i don't know if mm. this is this this industry um that makes it difficult to share what you have or you don't want to see the sun on shine on 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 other sides i don't i don't know but you've taken a different approach than like you should also if you want is the time that you spent mm -hmm. in training someone okay if i look at my own practice i would love to to help people and train them but it is time you yes. have so you this industry is it's quite challenging and also exhausting because it mm. can take it can assume your whole life so the time your time is really really limited mm. speaking of time how long would you say it takes you on average to write up a report it depends on the matter but you can do it in mm. one day okay 
Okay, that's not too bad. <laughs> but I suppose, <laughs> that's I suppose that, experience. Yes, I was going to say that, but I suppose that comes with experience. When you do your first one, it probably takes a lot longer than that. <laughs> And yes. then tell me, I'm, I, I would also love to know about um, the aspect of the possibility that you sometimes have to go to court. Have you had to go to court a lot? Yes. Um, I'm going to tell you two funny stories, okay? okay. I'm going to share that publicly. <laughs> okay. My hearing has decreased over the past few years. And the one day I was in court and... Um, usually you answer to the judge, your, your, uh, we call it counsel, it is the advocate that presents the case in court, okay, so you are the expert witness. So he asked the question and you answer to the judge. And so he didn't look at me and I couldn't read his lips and I couldn't hear clearly and then I just said, judge, please, can you just speak up? I can't, I, I can't hear you clearly. <laughs> So, so that was the first embarrassing one. The okay. second one is, um, it was a court that I attended in Bishu. The advocate was so happy that I um, showed up early because they were waiting for the experts. It was a terrible road to drive from East London. And she was hugging me and said, I'm so glad you're here. I said, okay, I've just got one problem. My, work, my hearing aids isn't working today. Okay, so the court started and she addressed the judge and said, Judge, we must just um, take note that Karen Swanepoel's hearing aid um, doesn't work today, so if we could just speak up. <laughs> it was so embarrassing. <laughs> so, yeah, but everyone yeah. laughed at the eyes and it was better in court. No, it is yeah. a very intimidating process. Yes. And um, years back, I would rather run away than attend court. But mm. if you have confidence in what you do, it's mm. not it's it's not difficult. Mm. If you have passion and you believe in what you've written, you believe in yourself and you believe in your report, there's no mm. way to stop. How do you gain that confidence? I mean. You might believe what you've written is true, but maybe you still have that imposter syndrome of like, but what if I'm wrong, you know, or like, and also I think the intimidation aspect doesn't only come into your report and the contents of it. I think it's just the environment. Like I, for example, find corporate quite corporate people intimidating. Like, you know, like if I know somebody is like a director or a CEO or something like I, the concept of going to sit in a boardroom and present something is intimidating for me. So mm. it would be the same thing with the court environment. It's like, you know, you get these advocates and the judges and they like, you know, and I think part of the reason is because there's that you're sitting in a court of law. How yeah. much knowledge do you, or do you need to have about the law? Um, and does that play a big part in how confident you are to sit in a court of law? Okay, so your first, the first thing is the most difficult thing of writing medical legal reports is the language. It's a okay. totally different, it's a law language. You mm -hmm. have to understand that. You have to have background, basic background about the law and the law processes. But luckily, you've got your advocate, your counsel, your attorney that always brief, you know, that also briefs you. Before you um, usually before a court case, you have a pre-trial. Then you sit mm. down with your counsel, your the uh, the advocate that go, that's going to present the case, and you talk about it through the arguments, and that already places you at ease, and it tells you I'm going to ask X, I, Z. Okay. Hmm. But when you stand there, you have to have the experience. I can't emphasize this more than 20 times. Because hmm. you, to have confidence, you have to have knowledge, and that is gained through experience. Hmm. Because they are asking difficult questions that hmm. you have to provide. As, as an expert, I have to be able to answer that. Hmm. So, yes, um, 
it's very intimidating. And the first time I went to court, I drank a lot of car mates. Yo, that was <laughs> terrible. <laughs> that was a terrible Can you experience. still remember your first court? Um, yes, I do. I do. Um, and it was interesting that, you know, uh, I've, I've taken an example to explain to the judge what I was trying to say in my ignorance. I told him, judge, would you appoint someone um, as your secretary with a great nine level of education and she can't speak it? So it's just putting it in simple terms that they also understand what you are saying. Okay, okay. So, but again, it comes to this thing of you need the experience to gain the knowledge to get the confidence. But in order to get the experience, you need to do your first one without the knowledge and the confidence. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what tips would you give? If there's somebody who's now already managed to get an opportunity to be in this field and now they have the first court appearance coming up, what advice would you give to that person to help them get through it, um, you know, so that they can keep building on that experience and get more knowledgeable as time goes? Okay. Number one, reach out to your colleagues. Ask them who has already attended a court appearance. Number two, know your case by heart. And number three, believe in what you've written. You are the expert. They, they are not the experts. You must come tell them this is what's happening. Because between you and me, the legal profession has their own expertise. They, mm. they are not expertise of loss of earnings and earning scales and you are the expert. They will listen mm. to you. So okay. have that confidence in yourself. Mm. But first of all, just Talk to your colleagues um, and make sure that what you say makes sense. The mm. other thing that they usually do in court is to try to, to discredit your... Yes, I was going to ask you about that. So the reason I was going to ask you about that is because I'm listening to you and all I can think about, are, because I'm a sucker for any uh, legal or medical series you know like those those shows like er uh, er and all of this stuff so as you're talking all i can picture is um like one of the the legal uh, dramas i used to watch and like the expert is on the stand and in the count you know the 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 counter arguments and what is the, the counter counsel i don't even know the legal terms but people on the other side the other team they come and like try and discredit your report and what you're saying and like tear holes in it and all of that stuff like does that actually happen or is that over dramatized and like how do you cope with that <laughs> no it does it does happen i remember the first court case was an hour and a half that the defendant side was questioning me and the, i could see the judge is also getting irritated it was a very young advocate and he started to ask me questions that was not in my scope. And I told him, I'm very sorry, I'm not an economist. I would refer that question to, okay. to that expert. So <laughs> while you are shaking inside, um, <laughs> answer short and sweet, and they, okay. will, they will realize that you know your field. You know okay. your boundaries. You know what you can say and you cannot say. You can't, for instance, if you don't have an educational psychologist report, mm. come there and say, well, I believe that this person would have obtained a grade 12 and then a degree. It's not mm. my scope. If okay. I want to say that, then I have to substantiate based okay. on my IP experience, based on factors mm. that I have considered to, 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 to make such a postulation. Mm, so you must mm. be very careful to remain in your scope. Mm. So what I'm hearing you say also that when you go and prepare for the first time is to rather say less and always um, yes. rather say you don't know if you don't know than try to be clever and come up with an answer. So only speak to what information you know for certain you've reported on in your report um, and not make assumptions or, you know, 
or postulations about things that you don't know and is not within your scope. And the less you give them that is unclear, the the yes. less they can actually, you know, like yes. try and discredit your findings. You don't create loopholes. Stay with mm. the facts, short okay. and sweet. And don't ask the judge to ask your supervisor or your colleague that's sitting in court just a quick question. I didn't know that. <laughs> Um, Dad, I just want to confirm with my colleague, uh, you don't know. <laughs> On that topic, like you didn't know that, right? Before you go for the first time, does the advocate and the team you're working with, do they normally like help to help you to like know the rules? Like I've never been in court, so I have no clue what the rules are. And obviously we think we know from American TV, but the way their court works is different to our court. Like, does somebody yeah. like take you through like the, the the more like logistical stuff? Like this is what happens when you, this is when you stand. This is how you address the judge. This is what you call the like like the, the terminology. This is what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. That kind of thing. <laughs> At first, my you know my first shocking experience, the traumatizing one. I didn't know anything. Okay. Um, it, he stepped into the court and suddenly my colleague said, bow, he was bow down. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, I bow, yeah. <laughs> um, and then when you get into your corner that you have to testify, you address the judge in a certain manner. Um, your honor, um, and you when when a question is posed to you by mm -hmm. your your counsel. Um, mm -hmm. your you know, your um, advocate is usually an advocate. Mm -hmm. Then you answer to the judge. You don't answer okay. him. Okay. No. Yeah, that's weird. No. So you have yeah, that is, you used to. <laughs> yeah. You, so you don't, you look at the counsel, okay, they ask the question, you look at the judge and you answer, yeah, okay. and, you, and, you, and you answer. Yeah, so mm -hmm. there's little things, but if you have a good counsel, then they will also oh, wow. guide you. And tell you, okay. pardon, I'm going to ask you this. I'm not going to ask you that. Be short and sweet, address like this. And oh, yeah. Are these um, like hearings closed? Um, is it possible for somebody to attend one? Like, obviously, with the permission of, say, 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 I'm now in, interested in doing this and I've started in this industry, but I'd like to see what it's like to be in court and. Um, I say to you, okay, Karen, like the next time you have to appear in court, can I come as like your yes. underling? And, uh, yes. Is that allowed? Yes. Okay. Because you, so, I mean, that, um, that might be a, a nice thing for people to do. And also just you can see for yourself then before you get too deep into this industry because maybe when it gets to things like that, you hate it so much that you actually then make a mistake going into this industry. So, Maybe that's a good idea for people who are, you know, interested to go and experience and see is this something that you 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 would be comfortable doing oh, and yes, learning definitely. about and getting confident in. Definitely, definitely. I would also okay. suggest something like that, yes, because it yeah. is it is an experience. Yeah. <laughs> but I, on the other hand, I must also brag about something. Mm. Okay. Um. When you, we don't go to court a lot because your reports are good. Okay. So that determines how many times you have to stand in a court of law. Mm, okay. Good point. Yeah. So listen, Karen, aside from Psycholegal Connect, I want to really talk about these workshops because that's really what, um, you know, put you on my radar is that I saw these workshops and I thought this is great. Like we, this is really needed. Tell me a little bit about those workshops. Like what types of workshops are they? What does it entail? Who would benefit from it? And when do you host them? Okay. Um, when you go onto the website, um, the dates are there and you can register. So mm -hmm. the first one we did is um, is the basic workshop. It's a three-hour virtual workshop that addresses the what, why, how of the medical legal industry. And that is open for specialists that wants to pursue such a um, career, students, in, interns, 
Because after that workshop, you will know, okay, this is for me or this is not for me. You will mm. get to hear the lingo. Um, what is this medical legal industry all about? Who is the role players? And what is everyone's role? Mm. Um, so that is your basic workshop. Because you get people that don't even, they don't have any clue of what medical legal entail. So you will have a very good knowledge about what it entails, what your role should be in this process. Then mm. after the basic workshop, we do intermediate workshop. That is more in-depth. So that is also for students, interns, graduates, um, people in private practice, professional people. Um, and it's more from an IP perspective okay. because, we, because we focus on how does a report look like? What must be in a report? Um, we, we address different scenarios. Um, a person living in the informal sector that got hurt um, and what is her future going to be like? Someone that works in the corporate sector. So we take different sectors and we use um, examples that we work with. And that is very important. Um, mm. do you, um, we like to use, um, and also in the workshop, we, we share the, the cases that we that we work with because you get amazing interesting cases um, then it's more in depth with regards to what earning scales do I use for this specific industry what do I look um, at what is the factors that can impact um, a person's career so it's much more in depth it's eight hours it starts at nine o'clock and ends at three o'clock um, and I'm very proud of that workshop so mm -hmm. and now uh, we are working towards advanced workshop with an actuary going okay. more in depth so mm -hmm. we give you because you can't take too much information it's yes. a lot yes. of information that we share with you in that intermediate and mm -hmm. we give you a look at this is how the earning scales look like and now how do i apply that how do I write that specific scenario? What language? Um, what must I do? What mustn't I do? Mm. Things like, I'm going to say the word that, um, it, to address contingencies. It's a huge topic within the IP world that it's very complex and no one really um, understands it at first. So that's why we, we incorporated um, a very nice actually. That's also mm. going to present some of the some of the topics. Mm. And I would assume that it would probably be best not to do them like back to back, to rather like say you do the, the first one and you apply that knowledge and then you do the, uh, the intermediate one and first try and apply that knowledge and then do the advanced one so that you have time for, or, or, or can you just do them like one after the other? I would rather suggest do the intermediate um, as soon as possible after the okay. basic. While okay. your information of the basic, well, um, you know, you, the information of the basic workshop is still fresh in your mind, do the intermediate. Because okay. after the intermediate, you will, you will have the courage um, and confidence to maybe contact the mentors to help you with specific matters. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just shocking that in some of the workshops, um, a person will say, I've never written, I've never done a report, but I'm seeing a client next week and I'm writing my first report. Mm. And I thought, oh, yo, yo, that is, <laughs> I wouldn't have been able to do that when I started. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. So listen, we spoke a lot about um, the, the actual, you know, doing the work, providing the service. And um, I'll definitely put all the links to the website and people can go check out those web work, those workshops. Highly recommend. It's always great to learn from somebody who's ahead of you, you know, at your early stages. But I want to flip over to the business end of things, right? Because this is a, a, a private industry, you basically running a business. We spoke about like how do you conduct the service, writing the reports, going to the, the the court, and maybe you love all that and that's wonderful. But 
at the end of the day, there's also like you have to run your own business and in order to provide the service. Yeah. So let's say you did get an opportunity to like do a few reports and, you know, have a few cases and now you want to go on your own. What is, what do you, what would you advise? What is the, the, the best advice you can give somebody who wants to start their own practice as a medical legal practitioner? What is a good way to start um, and, and get clients? Like, where do you get clients? How do you begin? So um, I call it my divine intervention. Okay. I was working for these IPs. Um, I gained a lot of experience, but it was in, in it's not always in very nice environments. Okay. So I've met with this one attorney. And she said, listen, Corinne, they need an IP in the Eastern Cape. I said, okay. She gave me a telephone number. Because all this time while working for others, I got this feeling I was pushed to go in a different direction, getting the confidence to work for myself. But I was too afraid. It's, and I found that number. And the person said, listen, we've got a lot of clients they need an industrial psychologist. I've nothing on paper. I've got mm. this. I've got this address. I know it's somewhere in the Eastern Cape in a rural area. I booked my flight. I booked my car. I flew down. I sat in that guest house. I sat on the bed, and my thoughts was, okay, SABC two is going to come into this guest house, <laughs> and they are going to say this was a hoax. This is what you don't do. Okay. <laughs> well, the, the following day, I got into my car, I took my GPS, I drove to the location, and I never looked back. Wow. And how old were you at that time? You, do you really <laughs> have to ask that question? <laughs> 46. Wow. Okay. So I was I'm thinking a you were going to say, you know, I thought you were going to say like you were in your 20s when you can be reckless and co throw caution to the wind. I'm very surprised. That is amazing because, and you know, I'm actually glad to hear that because there are so many people who are in their late 30s, early 40s, and they think, ah, oh, it's too late for me. You know, I've always wanted to start my practice. I've always been too scared. And now I'm this age and I'm, it's too late for me. So to hear you say that at that age, you decided to just go for it because there was an opportunity available to you and look where you are now. It's amazing. It's, it, it's, uh, it's such a blessing. But, mm. my, but my message is get out of your skin. Mm. Get mm. out. Don't sit and wait for work to come to you because it is not going to. Mm. The second thing that I did is um, while I was there, I was waiting for clients. Mm. And I decided, mm -mm, I'm taking my business card and I'm going to the high court. And everyone I met that looked like an attorney, I introduced <laughs> myself. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. years after that, that same attorneys and advocates, oh, Colin, I remember you. You, you were at court that day. And that is how yeah. I started to, you know, started to build my relationship. So mm. the other thing that's so important is your relationship with your clients. I love mm. my clients. I love my attorneys because we mm. have mutual respect. Um, mm. I previously told you they call me doc. I've explained mm. to them, and I've stopped stopped explaining, I'm not a doctor, but that is their way of showing me respect. To have that phone call and say, sir, I don't agree with this, we've got this and this problem, or you can phone me and say, Karen, I need that, um, I need your advice, I need your report. That relationship is so, so important. Mm. Your, your visibility is very important. When you yeah. say something, you have to deliver that and always mm. walk that extra mile. I love what I'm doing. I love my clients. It's extremely stressful. Believe me, <laughs> it's extremely stressful. But when you get there, it's, mm. I can't tell you the performance I, I experience. 
And yeah. the last thing that is that I want to tell you is to work with a team of people that you trust. Mm. I've got an amazing team. If you go on my website, you will see it's Valeska Kelly and hear your names. They are two directors in my company and they are growing the business into, um, into other provinces. And I've got mm. an amazing practice manager, Katrin. Mm. So the people that you work with is also very important because they mm. must believe in your, in your vision and yeah. work together to, to get to that goal. It's not my business. Mm. Um, we are all together as a team and we work towards that goal and we will reap the fruit of yeah. our hard work. Yeah. yeah. So um, the other thing I wanted to ask is when you start out, uh, you know, and you have to now obviously charge your client, charge the clients, right? What was that like when you had to, you know, the first time you had to say your rates? Like, do they generally ask you what your rates are or um, is how, do, how does that work? And how do you decide what you're supposed to charge for this? If you've never charged yourself, you maybe always work for somebody and just get paid, whatever. What, what advice would you give to people when it comes to setting rates and understanding the, the worth of the, of the service they provide? You know what? It, it differs from province to province. Okay. In Hoteng, some people ask elevated rates that I, I don't agree with. But in other provinces, it is much lower. But you get an idea when you work in this industry what amount you can charge and what amount is okay. I mean, yeah. Is unacceptable. Then, mm. based on your relationship with your client, and this is what is important to have that understanding of you want my product, you want a good product, but you must pay me before you get that product. Mm. Mm. And I think that made a huge difference versus giving the product and waiting for payment. Okay. And that mm. is when pr most of the practices are struggling. Struggling, and yeah. If you have that good understanding with your attorneys, they know how, how you work. So mm. if, you, if you have been building that relationship and you've got a good history with a specific client and they ask you, Corin, please, can I, can I pay this in three months or four months? You know that you can trust yes. that person, you can trust that relationship. And you will yeah. allow certain deviations um, mm. with regards to the way that you work. Yeah. And where would where would somebody find that information out, like what the average rates are in the province you're in? Because I'm sure people don't just tell you what they charge. Or do the attorneys, are you normally guided by the attorneys uh, when, the, when, when you ask them, like, what do, what do people typically charge? Um, there is specific rates that the raw that the RAF pay. I think okay. it's yeah, it's ten or eleven thousand Rand for a report. So you can base you can get an idea of what the RAF tariffs are. Um, and that is a report based on five hours, five or five or ten hours. A right per a, a right per hour. Okay. And and then you and then you talk to uh, you, yeah, you talk with your with your colleagues. I'm very um, privileged to work in a team with other specialists, um, and we discuss rates so that we don't over over charge or maybe under charge. And there's a lot of competition, so the people mm. will say, "Oh no, my my report is fifty percent less than your report." But mm. what is your quality? Mm. So, although you have, your, um, it, you know, it happened a lot that one of my clients went to another IP, paid less, but they, you know, that they come come back. Of course, mm. Mm. Yeah, I believe you what you pay for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you so much for that. I think that is some that covers some of the main things that people really, you know, struggle with. And I think to summarize some of the key points that I heard you say in terms of building your business side of things is one is that you, well, firstly, as a basis, you do have to have confidence in the actual providing of the service. But then one, when it comes to building the service, it's knowing who your clients are, right? So yes. your clients are actually the attorneys or the people who are 
coming to you for to provide the service for the end client. The end client isn't actually your client. Um, so that you know who to approach. It's getting out of your comfort zone, looking for opportunities and also building relationships. Um, it's knowing what your time is worth and actually providing yeah. a good product. And then I think uh, I think it's 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 great that you mentioned about you building your team because obviously in the beginning it's just going to be you, but a lot of people are really um, um, hesitant to scale and outsource things because they want mm. to like only I can do it, you know. Yeah. And what I'm hearing you say is that a huge component of your growth and longevity in this industry is that at a certain point you had to let go of certain functions, which is not your area of expertise like you shouldn't be doing practice manager stuff yeah because it's taking away time from providing the good quality product where your expertise actually is you know yes. so if you've got somebody else that's growing the business and somebody else that's doing the administrative stuff you can actually focus on providing the thing that you know providing the service to the best of your ability and i think yes. that's so important no matter what type of practice that you are actually running oh, so yes, thank you so much for that you're welcome Thank you so much. I really enjoyed your, uh, chatting to you and hearing all your funny stories. <laughs> um, and I really love what you're doing in the space. I think it's so important as no matter what industry you're in, uh, whether it's in health or in private, in corporate, in retail, whatever industry you're in, I think it's so important for us to seek to uplift and pass the baton on because, you know, we risk having a situation where you reduce the competition because there's less people qualified to do it, but then the industry dies out or you exactly. have less qualified or less quality things coming in because now because people are not getting the guidance or mentorship or support or knowledge or experience, they're doing their own thing and they're actually like causing havoc, you know, in order yeah. to yeah. maintain a good quality standard and maintain a positive brand of your industry you need to yes. make sure that the people coming in are upholding that so you have to share the information on you actually exactly. do yourself a disservice exactly. you know by yes. trying to keep it for yourself and then you know other people give your industry a bad name and then it reflects poorly on you so yes. i really admire what you are doing and and just thinking of being being you know operating a little bit outside of the box <laughs> thank you, and thank you. And it's really, i think your, your passion for this industry really reflects in that work that you do so thank you so much for sharing oh thank you Dustin, and thank you for having me